So I, I imagine many of you will know who David Baddiel is, but I'm going to introduce you Thanks. from these bullet points. You're welcome. Uh, comedian, author, screenwriter, television presenter, 1992, performed in the UK's first ever arena comedy show at Wembley. Starred the Mary Whitehouse Experience, Newman and Medellin pieces, fantasy football. Sorry, the energy's tailing off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's a structural problem with me rather okay. than your career. Okay. Um, he has created and presented several acclaimed documentaries. He's written 10 successful children's books, as well as four acclaimed adult novels. His last book, Jews Don't Count, was the Sunday Times Political and Current Affairs Book of the Year in 2021. And last year, it was adapted into a documentary for Channel 4. The new book is The God Desire. Ben Quash is the Professor of Christianity and the Arts at King's College London, a frequent broadcaster on BBC Radio. A particular interest in how the arts can renew people's engagement with the Bible and Christian tradition. He is the author of the books Found Theology, Abiding, and was co-editor of the book Heresies and How to Avoid Them. And he is the director of the VCS, the Visual Commentary on Scripture, a curated ongoing online exhibition that puts work of art in dialogue. I'm Richard Ayuadi. I, I used to be in the IT crowd. <laughs> um, why am I sandwiched between such eminence? Well, David asked me, so I must thank you, David. And also I must thank my wife, Lydia, um, because uh, she was taught by Ben, uh, first as an undergraduate and recently doing masters. And she suggested when Ben, uh, when, when David kindly asked me to do this, that I ought to uh, immediately asked someone far more intelligent and distinguished uh, than me to make up for my shortcomings. So thank you both uh, for being here, and I can only apologize in advance. So the first thing I'd like to ask David is, why did you write this book? What, it is, what is it roughly about? Okay. Uh, well, I might read a bit from it to explain what it's about. Uh, why I wrote it is uh, I wrote a book, as you mentioned, called Jews Don't Count, which I was asked to write by the Times Literary Supplement. Uh, I wasn't specifically asked to write that book. I was asked to write an essay book. They had this idea, which is quite a good idea, I think, to try and revive a literary tradition, which is sort of uh, Orwell used to write books that were quite short, that were probably polemical, that had an element of pamphlet to them. Uh, and so he would take a particular thought that he had had on language and politics, whatever it might be, and he would write, I, I don't know, he would write like 100 pages or 80 pages about it. And uh, they wanted to revive that tradition. They said, you could write about whatever you like. So I wrote about how, in my opinion, Jews are kind of downgraded in the identity politics conversation. And then that book did all right. And they asked me to write another one. Uh, and I think what they really wanted was a sequel. They wanted me to write Jews still don't count. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't really want to do that because I thought, well, I'll do that when my career is going worse. Uh, okay, sure. And so I thought, what else? What else am I sort of deeply engaged with? What else do I give quite a lot of thought to? And it was for me, it was atheism. But my particular type of atheism, which in a way follows on from Jews don't count, because in Jews don't count, obviously, I talk a bit about I talk a lot about being Jewish. But I also talk about something very specific in that. There's a moment in that which turned out to be uh, what I thought would be obvious, but is not. Uh, I thought it would be on the, on the nursery slopes of that conversation, yeah. which is that anti-Semitism is racism. And uh, the way I illustrate that anti-Semitism is racism and not religious intolerance is by saying I'm an atheist, but that would get me no free passes out of Auschwitz. And that turned out to be something of a breakthrough for a lot of people who hadn't understood that about anti-Semitism. And then I thought, well, I could probably follow on about what it means to be a, a Jewish atheist. And to do that, I need to outline why I'm an atheist. And the book does that. And yeah. perhaps I should now read a yeah, bit to, to good. give yeah. a sense of it. Um, so this is quite early on in the book. I, actually, to explain this bit, I'll just read out the two epigraphs at the start, uh, which I chose very late on uh, in the book, when I thought, oh, it should probably have some epigraphs. Uh, before the divine kingdom can be established in events, it has to be established in the mind, in the human imagination. Bishop, Bishop Richard Harris thought for the day, BBC Radio 4, 4th of November 2022. And we cherish the illusion that exalts us more than a host of baser truths by Alexander Pushkin. Uh, and then in the, and page five, I say, when you write a book, you spend a fair bit of time thinking about the epigraph. In truth, it's probably procrastination. Writing a book is hard, whereas decorating a book, choosing a cover, blurbs, epigrams, is not, comparatively. 
I chose two quotes, which you may have just read. I like those two. They are, I think, apposite. But the one I really wanted to use was this. A close friend once said to me, but don't you want to believe in God? I said, yes, desperately. That's why I know he doesn't exist. It's the opening sentence of The Belief System, a book by an atheist thinker, Virginia Brooke. But Virginia Brooke is a character of my own devising who appears in my own play, God's Dice. And using one of my own quotes as an epigraph is just too naff. I thought I might be able to get away with it on the basis that this book is about the non-existence of something. So perhaps it would be apt to begin with a quote from a book that doesn't exist. I thought that might be meta and clever enough to carry it through. But in the end, it's just too Alan Partridge a move. <laughs> Nonetheless, the quote does sit at the centre of this polemic. Most arguments for atheism are philosophical. Sometimes they tie themselves in knots, grappling with the issue of how you can prove the non-existence of something. At heart, they are based on the idea that there is no evidence for God's existence, therefore he doesn't exist. My argument, on the other hand, is in a general sense, psychological. It requires an admission, which, is, which frankly most atheists, I've noticed, aren't prepared to make. Which is, I love God. The idea, that is, of him. For the purpose of this polemic, I'm going to stick with the patriarchal traditional pronoun. Although I believe a modern God would almost definitely have a Twitter bio that ended they stroke them. <laughs> who would not love a superhero dad who chases off death? Some non-believers reading this will think, speak for yourself. It's common amongst atheists in trashing religion also to trash the rewards of religion. Or to be more specific, to disavow the presence in themselves of what religion is there to serve. There is something a little macho in atheism. Some atheists divine, correctly, that what religion provides for human beings is comfort. And then, in a way that can feel a bit adolescent, they feel impelled to say, essentially, comfort, that's for babies. But humans, a subset of which includes all atheists, are babies. However old and intellectual and cynical they grow, no matter how adult and controlled we seem on the surface, underneath we are a hive of wailing, impulsive, immediate need. I'm happy to admit to my own babyishness. That might be because, or rather why, I am a comedian. Much comedy is just that, stripping away the facade of adulthood. We are all winging adulthood, truly. There is only one adult in the world whose age in his soul lines up with the age he in fact is, and his name is Michael Gove. <laughs> I am flawed and shallow and scared and often desperately in need of comfort, both psychological and physical. I am, however, someone with enough self-awareness to perceive these as urges rather than ideas. My thinking self, in other words, is distinct from my urgent one. Not all the time. I often find myself thinking, I must eat now or I will die, even when it's only 11 in the morning. But I'm conscious, even as I think it, that this isn't a logical way to understand the world or even the phenomenon of feeling peckish. I know even as I experience desire that it is desire and that desire provides no frame for reality. The God desire should not have to lead to the God delusion. Yet the desire is real. For me, it is the very intensity of it which alerts me to the fact of fantasy. The need to imagine that there is an exit door, somewhere through which to escape constantly on oncoming death, is one that I can confidently predict exists within the deep recesses of most humans. And the pressure of that desire has always and will always lead to divine projection. People talk a lot about what it means to be human, about what separates us from the animals. Some of that is lyrical, love and empathy and stuff. I personally think it can be pinned down to the fact that we are the only animals who feel shame in defecating. But whether it make, makes us human or not, we are the only animal that from an early age is aware of the inevitability of death. So it is impossible to look at the repetitive creation of legends across every culture and throughout history, which in one way or another outsmart death and promise immortality without concluding that God is a projection of a very fundamental desire within us for it not to be so inevitable. So that's what it's about. It's about how much I feel the desire that I think 
in a mass psychology way, has led to the creation of God as an idea in many different forms. And this desire is served by many different types of God and not just the traditional Judeo-Christian God. And also it's not just death. It's also about meaning, about storifying life, about providing some kind of order to life, some kind of justice to life. All those things are served by God. And I feel those things. I feel the need for those things as much as anyone else. And the, the feeling of that need is what leads me to my atheism. Okay, good. Now, I'm going to ask for Ben's response um, to the book uh, when you read it and also to the question of desire and what it means to desire God um, in terms of your understanding with regards to uh, David's book. First of all, I want to say thank you to David for writing it. And the, um, the fact that most, most bookshops don't stock any books in theology these days at all, except very specialised ones, um, means that I rejoice that a book that's actually doing theology in lots of ways, in, in the sense that it's raising big questions about the nature of the world, the kind of world we live in, and what it is to live in it well, honestly, and um, and to address questions like love and so on. These are these are this is the sort of terrain of theology, um, and unfortunately, what you normally get in bookshops is a little small, even not even a whole bookshelf sometimes, but a few shelves that just called religion, and religion is not the same as theology. Mm. Religion is the study of a set of human practices over time, more of a sort of social science type of activity. And theology is about what you're doing. It's about these sorts of profoundly engaging questions. We care, orient the way we live. Um, so thank you for getting theology out in, in this form. Um, as a theologian, I'm really grateful. And I also think it's, it's, you call it a polemic, but it's actually a very sort of generous and quite vulnerable book. Yeah, it's not really a polemic. It's not a polemic. No. And um, so I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it too, and particularly the personal bits. I think I wrote the, polem the word polemic quite early on and, and then, then forgot to change it. Different. Yeah, forgot to change okay. it. Yeah. 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 yeah, well, that's great. That's difficult. Um, so we're dealing with the first draft. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I know it's in a book, but I should have revised that. I understand. That, yeah. um, so I, I, do, I really want to also celebrate the fact that it's about something much more interesting than the existence of God, which, as I, you, you say in the book, and Alain de Botton has said elsewhere, in a way is often a very boring and unproductive question. Yeah. So I hope we won't spend much time on that tonight. I think the, des the question of desire and the desire for God is really interesting. Um, and I suppose my first response in reading it was to, to wonder to, about... So I, I, was, I found myself having to ask whether I agreed with you on the, on, on the huge importance you give to death as a sort of definitive... It's partly doing the explanatory job of, of, of accounting for why we have the desire. It's because of death that we have this desire. Um, and also, clearly, in your own biography, figures very centrally in, in your relationship with the idea of God. And, um, and I, the reason it's a difficult question to ask is because one can easily be self-deluding about this. But I didn't find death as, I don't find death as much of an issue as I think you do. Um, and, and in some ways, I, I, you know, I have a sense that if I can get to the end of my life and not have done anything too terrible, right. I'll feel a certain relief about it. So death, in a way, sort of stands for drawing stumps and, you know, quite apart from questions of the afterlife, you know, I, I hope I, I won't have really cocked it up. Right. Um, and also, uh, I quite like anaesthetics. I've, when The few times I've been in hospital, I quite like that sense of brief oblivion. When do you like it? Uh, both before... When you wake up. When I wake up, yeah. yeah. Okay, good point. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Ah, but here, but on that, um, Ingmar Bergman um, once had an operation, and this isn't a great story so far, but he had an operation, and he's, he spent his life anguished by a judgmental God, a, a rather severe Lutheran father, and he said the relief of his having consciousness and then it stopping was the most thrilling thing that had happened to him at that point. Just that 
judgment had gone mm. and that there was no one pointing the finger and that it just stopped. Mm. And he felt that gave him a, a kind of confidence. Yeah, I and mean, I, again, that's a judgment or, a, 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 you know, something he's coming to from the point of view of consciousness. You know, he can only make that sense of like, oh, I he love He had a that. secretary just before he nodded off and <laughs> she just said, uh, but, but I said, of course, it's from the point of view of consciousness, but it's an experience of, no, of non-consciousness and a comfortable, being comfortable with the prospect of non-consciousness mm. in the future as well. Okay, but, well, I should perhaps explain something. So t two things. One is mm. the uh, individual experience you're talking about. The book actually begins with, or just before the bit I read, which is it like, begins by talking about um, how my mum, uh, when I was sort of six or seven years old, and I first understood that we die, and I would first got the, that as a realization, which obviously we all come to, I'd sort of tried to talk to her about it because I was frightened. And she said, oh, don't worry, it's like a long sleep from which you never wake up. Now, some people may know this about me, but I'm an insomniac. And I think <laughs> that's when that kicked in, because uh, I, I like sleeping. I love sleeping. Sleeping's great when I achieve it, but I think my love of sleeping is a lot to do with the knowledge that I'm going to wake up. Uh, and by the way, when I, you know, a few people have said this to me, that, oh, you know, I'm not frightened of death, kind of in the way that you seem to be in the book. And I, I, I totally accept that, so someone said to me the other day that Joan Bakewell uh, had been talking about being 91 and sort of looking forward to death. And in, on an individual basis, I can obviously see that to be the case. What I'm talking about here is a mass psychology, mm. uh, the way that cultures in general will create a legend to outsmart death and to, uh, you know, all sorts of other things that it will do as well. It will explain mm. or, and find ways through all sorts of other things that seem to the culture like this is not how I want things to be or and I don't understand this and I don't like this encroaching darkness or this encroaching earthquake or whatever else it might be mm. so basically it doesn't need to be an individual sense in which I can understand I mean, as an individual uh, yeah. Ingmar Bergman or you mm. uh, might think like no I quite like the idea of sort of unconsciousness but I don't believe that that negates the idea that as cultures we have tried to find ways around death many so many stories are about resurrection yeah and why are they about resurrection yeah. why indeed uh, at the basis of christian prayer you'll have to tell me the exact prayer but it's like it's what is it it's something in the funeral service about how death will be vanquished mm. the vanquishing of death is at the heart of many many religious ideas and why should that be mm. yeah well, I suppose, um, you, as you say, your book starts with this image of your mother reassuring you, um, well, Wrong. failing to reassure yeah, you yeah. Um, about death. And I suppose in one way, I suppose saying it's not going to be painful or frightening and mm. in some way it's going to yeah. be gentle. So I guess it brings up the question um, of finitude, um, which uh, we were talking about earlier. Um, and to what extent is... Um, would you call it a fear in uh, culture or your fear or uh, your fear, which you see uh, occurring more widely, which is of one's own consciousness ending yeah. of, of life being finite? Yeah. How much of that plays into your desire for God as something that stops your own finitude? Oh, I think that, that for me, that's key. And it's, I mean, I, I mentioned in the book something that atheists say. Uh, I think I quote Bertrand Russell, uh, and Dawkins has said the same thing. Uh, Bertrand Russell said quite famously that he would scorn mm. uh, to the idea of shivering at his own oblivion. Yeah. I, he's scornful about the idea that you should be frightened of oblivion. Uh, now, there's two things going on there. Number one is, again, this atheist machismo. Uh, it's like, you know, oh, you know, all these fairy tales that people need to make up in order to comfort themselves from the ideas of whatever they're frightened of, principally death, but all sorts of things they're frightened of. I, the great atheist, need have no need of this. I don't believe that. Yeah. I think that's a pose that a lot of atheists take in order to feel kind of grown up and proper and big. Uh, but there's uh, something else going on there, which is I think Dawkins has said, a similar thing, but not quite in not quite as lofty a way as Russell, which is that why should you be frightened of death because you won't know you're dead? And that seems very logical, but it's deeply, for me, inhuman because you're only saying that from the point of view of life. And from the point of view of life, I promise you, life seems a lot fucking better. It really does. Like, I, I, like it, I, you know, some people in here might think, well, I, 
I find life so difficult or whatever that I find the idea of nothingness sort of more attractive. But I think that's unlikely. I think that one of the things about the book is it's... I mean, I was born in Ipswich, so... <laughs> well, we, we I have lived to, re we have I to lived relativize in, this. I, I, when my mum was talking to me, I was living in Dollis Hill in 1973. So I can tell you that, yes. as I say in the book, was a kind of death. But I... I think the book is powered, and I quote John Updike quite a lot in the book, John Updike, yes. who is my favourite writer, and who was a Christian and deeply believed in God, but I think what I share with Updike, uh, Updike had an almost hysterical, but beautifully written, attachment to life. Like he was so, like he, a late book by Updike is called Terrorist. It's like a lot of Updike books, it's not that good. But what it's about, it's about a, um, a suicide bomber. And you might ask, why is John Updike writing about a suicide bomber? I think it's because he got old and he thought, I need to write about someone who is in love in the way that I am with life, with death. I need to somehow manage the idea of death and create the love that I feel for life throughout death. He calls uh, life this complex interval of light, which I think is so beautiful. And I think that that's, you know, the book, if, if it has a, a sort of positive energy, because uh, it might sound a bit deathy the way that we're talking about it, but the positive energy is, a, is that. It's a deep commitment and love of whatever life may hold, even though life holds lots of shit things. Mm. It's still, for me, better than oblivion. Mm. And I think that exists deeply in all of us, even if we might buy into a, what I think is a slightly religious thing of, well, there's a sort of serenity infinitude. Can I just come, because I think that the, that idea of an interval of light um, it is, is fascinating. I mean, it actually reminds me of the Venerable Bede, the kind of great early British theologian, who I think tells the story of, of a sparrow flying into the, the hall, a feasting hall through one window and, and out the other. And he says that's an image of life, you know, this brief moment where from the cold and the dark, you're, you're briefly in this place of noise, music, set, laughter, and light, and then out again. Um, but, but it seems to me that part of the, um, the conditions for being able to celebrate and enjoy that interval is that it's finite. So there's a, there's a curious way in which death is the necessary bookend to all the good things that one enjoys. And a, and a healthy, this is true for anyone, whether religious or not, that a kind of healthy relationship to one's own death becomes a condition for a, a properly celebratory way of living now yeah and without death and it, the idea that somehow your life could just stretch on mm. and on it would cease to be a joyous thing at all of course yeah but what you're talking now is a kind of like you know nice he, he, almost humanist logical way of mm. thinking about death the creation of god comes from a much much deeper mm. psychological soup that is nothing to do with well obviously I, mean, I agree with you obviously life would start to become exhausting and meaningless and weird if you just live forever it would mm. it wouldn't work mm. that doesn't mean you don't want it yeah because wants and desires come from I a just, much more complex yeah. unsayable not logical place than yeah. worked out in your head like oh yeah that wouldn't actually be very nice to live forever of course mm. it wouldn't yes the only thing though is that well, you've written a book, yeah. which is logical and worked out and, and put in those terms, um, but about uh, psychology. So it's not necessarily the case or from a psychological sense of why I might desire this. So they're, they're perhaps not in opposition, the idea of something that is worked out and rational and desirous. Yes, I, I don't right? actually completely agree with that. There's a okay. bit in the book where I talk about uh, how God is also, like it's not just about death, I think God is also, and I use Updike this, Updike talks about how uh, he, he also, uh, it's a bit about sleep as well, and he, he imagines humanity as kind of the child in bed uh, being comforted by the sounds mm -hmm. downstairs, comforted by knowing that your parents are downstairs. Uh, and he talks about how that sort of creates that there must be something beyond, there must be gods, there must be people watching over us. And that mustness, that imperative, is his reason for why there is a god. And it's my reason well, for why there isn't. Let me just explain something else. Yes, to I'm going to get the end of Pigeon fe Feathers okay. ready. Oh yeah, well Pigeon Feathers is fantastic. Um, but one of the things is that I also talk about God as not just being 
uh, a way of uh, outsmarting death, but also a way of providing this parent figure. And again, it's not as simple as like, it's just a caring parent. You know, I don't want to get all Freudian on it, but the way that we might, if we were to unconsciously project a parent figure that is always there for us, they would also be angry. They would also be hateful. They would also be difficult. We would also have to be constantly doing things for them that might not match up to what we wanted because what we are in the unconscious is a soup of anxiety and desire. But I wasn't going to call it the God Anxiety and Desire because that's a shit title. Okay. Well, that can be the sequel, okay. of course. Well, that, that may, sorry, that may yes. explain... Cause one of the things that really interests me as well is that uh, there was a, a theologian, a 20th century German theologian who then moved to America called Paul Tillich. And, yeah. He described Updike him, loves he No, I haven't, except in the writings of John Updike. Okay, he's in Updike. Tillich, okay. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, and Tillich describes three different things that uh, over, you know, it's a, it's a very broad brush sort of meta narrative that probably one, we ought to be suspicious of. But he describes three different points in Christian history in the 2000 years where people look to God to sort out three different anxieties. Um, and death was the first one, interestingly. So lots of early Christian art is centered on the idea of conquest of death, the triumph over death. Um, and, and the sorts of things that are depicted in art are often moments of victory. And it's either the devil or, or some, some sort of visualization of death as a monster or whatever being defeated. Yeah. Yeah. And then in the, in the time of the Reformation, it's sin. And, and, uh, and so what God does is sort out s not so much death, but, but the problem of sin, because people are really worried about that. Yeah. And then he suggests that the, the, that the modern, big modern anxiety is meaninglessness. And you, as you've, as you've said in summarizing the book, in a way you deal with the first and the third. And there's a sort of interesting hole there in the middle about the sin one. I yeah, you're about probably that. right about that. And it's interesting that I have to bring in Frank Skinner at this point because uh, I tell this story. Um, I, t I tell this story about how when I first met Frank, um, I didn't realize how devout and how literal a Catholic Frank mm. was. And uh, we went uh, on a long journey, on a long car journey, uh, and he was explaining to me something very specific, which I think I'm going to tell you uh, because it's in its mechanics, because the mechanics interest me. So Frank at the time w had left his wife, um, and he was living, I think he'd actually got divorced, and he was living with his girlfriend, uh, and uh, he was having sex with his girlfriend. Now that, in the Catholic Church, is adultery. Right, And he was explaining to me that what this meant was, was that he couldn't go to confession because to get confession, you have to confess your sin and then promise not to do it anymore, at which point you get absolution and then you can take communion. Right, And he's explaining this to me over about an hour and a half because I don't really understand it. And at the end of it, I get out the car at Birmingham New Street Station and I say to him, sorry, why are you bothered about all this? And he said, no, you don't understand. I think I will burn in hellfire because of this. And I literally had never heard anyone say that. You know, I don't live in 1605. I'd never heard anyone say that and, and really mean it. And I was really kind of impressed at some level. I didn't think, oh, he, thus he's an idiot. I thought that's incredibly impressive that he really, uh, really feels that. Mm. That makes him more interesting. I'd only just met him. I mean, more interesting a person mm. than I thought. Uh, but what it does mean, in terms of what you're saying, and that's probably true, is because I come from, I guess, a Jewish background, and obviously the book is quite Talmudic at mm. some level, Jews don't have much of a conception of an afterlife. And the judgment that is going on for Jews, for Orthodox Jews, and by the way, there are 613 mitzvot, which are yep. things you're meant to be doing all the time as a Jew. As far as I can make out, it's a kind of OCD thing where you're what, you've got to kind of wrap something around your head or turn off a light or not eat this bit of pork or whatever the fuck it is. And, the, and what, the, what those people, where that comes from, the anxiety and primordial soup that comes from is anxiety about judgment in this life. Mm. And that comes, and I should have said this in the book, this is all kind of interesting, I wish I'd put this in the book, but anyway, second yeah. edition, <laughs> that comes from being a persecuted minority. Mm. That comes from the sense that people are going to do bad things to you all the time, and you can't really do anything about it, but maybe if you do all these weird things all the time, they will shield you from it. Mm. Uh, but what I don't have, I think, is a sense, which you've sort of mentioned, of the idea of judgment in the life to come, and so maybe that is why I've missed that out, because I guess 
Yes, if you are really frightened, in a genuine way of judgment in the life to come, oblivion may, may seem preferable. I don't think it really makes much difference to my sense that God is still a creation of desire and anxiety. It may it's just not, another no. type of anxiety. I suppose the question, part of the question is whether that is as primordial a part of all human experience as, as the fear of death is. And, yeah. um, or, or whether part of what you know, you've characterized as some of the differences between Judaism and Christianity might suggest that there are more sort of historically inflected circumstances in which some kinds of anxiety dominate. And I guess that's Tillich's point. Um, so it might not be as universal. You know, there might be more sort of, more, more variety in the, the historical contexts and the, and the cultural and religious contexts in which people need God for different things. So, you know, there may be a, there may yeah. be something that's less primordial, in and other words. Maybe it's that. interesting to talk about, I guess, desire and what mm. I guess what we mean by desire, what you mean by desire, how I guess you've alluded to the idea that it's perhaps not entirely conscious. Yeah. To what degree do you choose what you desire? As Updike, yeah. I think, said, I chose to believe in God. Yes. That he, he made that consciously. And C.S. Lewis would say, if your rationality gets in your way, gets in the way of your faith, then don't have it, as in it, it has to involve your rationality. But so I guess my question is, how do you know what you're desiring? Is it by seeing what your life is like and go, oh, I can back sort of reverse engineer from mm. what it seems to be I'm projecting? How can you tell what your desires are, I suppose? I'm yeah. saying? And uh, this isn't that, a come on. No, no. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question, I think, because I think in the book I am retro engineering. I am uh, looking at what I think God does uh, in terms of what, what he serves in the human psyche. And I'm retro engineering and saying, OK, well, these are things that I feel, which is I am frightened of death. I am frightened of meaninglessness. Uh, I sort of wish there was a more universal justice. Uh, and I also beyond that, and that's more psychoanalytical, have a sense that, yeah, there's all these anxieties and unknown things. So desire as a if one is to be Freudian about it, desire would always be something that you might not be able to completely name and identify. Yeah. So I am assuming in writing about the God desire that some of those desires might be at the forefront of your head and some of them will be almost unnameable. And that is partly why I think the imagination of God isn't just a straightforward thing. And it certainly isn't just straightforwardly a good, nice thing, right. I think. Um, because I think we're trying to play out all sorts of things that might come under the headline of desire. But I, I, I wouldn't be able to say you can name all of them. Yeah. And yes, what was your response to the question of desire within the book? And, and is there a specific kind of desire for God that is different from other desires? That's I a, suppose. a hard question. I, I think there yeah, is. Yeah. yeah. Well, OK, so the, the, one of the classic statements about desire is St. Augustine, the, the fourth and early fifth century bishop in North Africa, um, who, who says in the, in his confessions, our, our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. He's, he's talking to God. Most of the book is a lot of extended address to God. In terms of desire, and, and, he also and, says, God may be celibate, but not yet. Yeah, there's that great one about <laughs> yeah, that. So yeah. co continence, you know, he wants continence only when yeah. the time is right. Yeah. Um, but the, that, that sense of the heart being restless until it finds its rest is probably one of the most paradigmatic theological statements of what desire for God is. It's the sort of ultimate rest, it's connected with the idea of ultimate rest. And um, we, it's quite proper from Augustine's point of view to desire anything that God has made. So, you know, the world is full of desirable things and that's good. But the, the problem as Augustine sees it is to desire them as though they are, they're going to give you that final rest. Um, even, even those you most dearly love, um, you know, they won't ultimately abide. And, you, and so, you know, there's always going to be a, a sense of loss and so on. So in a way, he's dealing with some of the same anxieties that you describe of losing your parents and losing your best friend. Um, and he, go, he describes these experiences of, of bereavement in the book. Um, so for him, the key thing about the desire for God is that it's the, God is the only object that doesn't let you down in the end. And the, and the way to love things in the world is to love them as, as if you like, a, a, a part of your love for God or as a way of loving God rather than as if they were God. 
Right. So I guess that would be, uh, that's like mm. hiding behind Augustine, but that would be part of an answer that I feel has some interest. But you brought up something there which I think is important, which slightly takes us back to what we were talking about earlier, which is to talk about being very frightened of death can make you feel, in a way, very narcissistic. Mm -hmm. I sort of deal with this in the book about how uh, early on in my life I read about the idea that it was very narcissistic to be very frightened of your own extinction. Uh, and then actually, again, I know we've mentioned him a lot, but Updike in Self-Consciousness, which I think you've got there. Oh, that's so, under there. This is right. um, Pigeon Feathers. Okay, Self-Consciousness, he talks about how... Uh, it's the opposite, mm. that what you want, if you want your not to die, is you want to be part of the social being. Mm. You don't, you want to stay in the party. You want to be with people. And of course, as I've grown older, one thing that's become clear to me as well is that if you want to talk about the front of your head and desires that you know about, other people you love die. Mm. Never yeah. mind you and your own oblivion. Other people you deeply love die. Uh, and, the re and actually, early on in the book, when I'm talking about me as a six-year-old, I'm praying. Mm. I'm praying to Hashem, which is the Jewish, the Hebrew word for God. And I'm praying that I should see my mum mm. and dad and my best friend Saul Rosenberg <laughs> again after I die. Mm. Uh, because it is about being amongst people amongst love and about, about the immediacy of, you know, friends and relatives or whatever. So I think that's important in terms of like understanding when I'm talking about the God desire, it isn't just like my own oblivion that mm. I'm talking about here. Well, the end of Pigeon Feathers c could be written for you um, when he's describing at the end, holding these two pigeons. And um, he, he says in the, in the book, uh, the slipping sensation along his nerves that seemed to give the air hands, he was robed in this certainty that the God who had lavished such craft upon these worthless birds would not destroy his whole creation by refusing to let David live forever. Right, well, that, that's, so just to be clear, if people don't, don't know, so, that short story by John Updike is about uh, a, a guy who has a crisis of faith and then sees a pigeon feather and is moved by the intricacy mm. of the pigeon feather to confirm his sense that God must exist because why would so much, as you say, so much incredible apparent energy yes. and thought and, and design particularly beauty and beauty, as well. and beauty, absolutely, go into something. Uh, and that's where we get into an interesting thing, which is, so in this book, I don't spend much time, I talk about it a bit, but I sort of like spend quite a lot of time dismissing certain arguments, like I'm not going to bother with that. So I'm yeah. not going to bother to get into arguments about what existed before the Big Bang, yes. or is there some kind of designer to the, or whatever, because I kind of think those things are basically unknowable. No, and what seems very interesting about the book um, is you talking about what you want, and, you're, and what's uh, so interesting about it is, it's as much a question to you and, and what you feel your desires are and, and what could possibly answer it. Yeah. And, and so I guess along that, here's a question which is, which I guess uh, speaks to what Ben was saying, which is, does this desire for God make us live better, um, live more meaningfully, live in a more worthy way? Um, is that true? And also, I suppose, it seems to me, and this may not be the case, you seem to uh, suggest that, well, truth is a higher value mm. than any conception of this God. Yeah. Um, and I suppose, why would you not write a book called The Truth Desire? As in, why is the desire for truth, imp why is truth important to you?